at Big Data SV 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsors WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible and Actian accelerating Big Data 2.0. Okay, we're back here live in uh, Big Data Silicon Valley. That's hashtag Big Data SV. Check it out on Twitter. Go to crowdchat.net slash Big Data SV. Join the conversation. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the ceiling from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. Join my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of wikibon.org. And we are here in San Francisco, I mean in Silicon Valley, covering Big Data. Uh, the Strata conference is going on right behind us. We're covering all the top news coming out of that event. All, everyone's here, entrepreneurs, CEOs, executives, uh, VCs. We're going to talk to them all and get the signal from the noise for you. This is theCUBE. Our next guest is Josh Rogers, president of SingSword. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so let, I first got to ask you, we were talking before you came on about the big data. I mean, it's a, it's a new market, so there's new stuff happening, but the market's maturing. I want to get your yeah. take on what you see happening here on the ground. Share with the folks the vibe this year at Big Data SV and Strata Conference. What's happening on the ground here? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the first things we've seen that's pretty basic, but pretty important and pretty critical, is just there's actual budget allocated to big data projects this year, which is pretty fundamental, right? Uh, I think 2013 year, 2013 was a year of experimentation, a lot of um, you know, POCs, a lot of uh, understanding what functionally can the technology do. 2014, we're walking to an environment where customers have allocated budget to build production systems. Um, and I think that's uh, a, a fundamental step, obviously, but I think it's also going to come with a set of requirements that they're going to expect these technologies to start to deliver in production. And so I think we're, uh, <clears throat> we're, gonna, we're in for a very interesting year. Dave, I want to get your take on it. What do, you, what do you think is happening with big data right now? I mean, we heard the suits comment earlier by HP, more suits this year than t-shirts or hoodies. I don't forget what his quote was, but it was something along those lines. The budget's being allocated, Josh mentioning that. What's your take? Well, I think we're seeing a situation where a lot of people are realizing that they can do the same or much more for way less. Right. You know, so you're talking about a, 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 at least a 10x factor in yep. some cases. So, you know, that's getting attention to the suits and yep. the wallets. They're saying, wow, we can, we can cut our budget by, you know, maybe two thirds, may, maybe even more, uh, and we can, we can drive business outcomes that are going to drive revenue. I mean, it's, so, I think it's so hard to move the needle and, you know, pick a, pick a segment. Take, take marketing, for example. Uh, and Josh, I'd love to get your take on this. Yeah. Y you know, email marketing. You know, you, you, you talk to email marketers and they, or marketers and they say, you can't move the needle anymore. And right. now we're talking about analytics. Um, driving whole new realms of, of business outcomes. And, and a lot of that is you know, getting the data in, cleaning right. the data right. up, yep. you know, uh, getting data out of legacy systems, so, and that's kind of your specialty. So yeah, absolutely. So I think you know, there's lots of folks that have ambitions around creating new insights that'll drive big value. Um, but what we're finding is that customers need a place to start that can give them an immediate win. And we refer to that as offload. So there's lots of legacy repositories that are doing important, but um, uh, not, not potentially efficient uh, workloads. And they've been doing them for decades uh, in many cases. And what they're finding is they can take those workloads and move them into things like Hadoop and do it for a fraction of the cost. So I might, it may cost me $100,000 a terabyte to manage data in my enterprise data warehouse. I might be able to do that in Hadoop for $1,000. So if I start with that as my first project, there's a bunch of positive benefits that accrue. The first is I save a ton of money, right? So I can actually free up budget to either give back to the corporation or, um, you know, build out this new, uh, you know, Hadoop cluster that's going to be a foundational to my big data uh, efforts. Uh, the second is I actually learn how to, you know, build and manage this infrastructure. Um, and the third is I actually end up with data in my cluster. So I actually can now, I've got an environment that I've built that I understand how to manage um, that I can actually start to use for some of these uh, more ambitious goals. But I'm starting with something that provides me a, an immediate ROI. It doesn't actually have the risk associated of failure that some of the you know, un, <coughs> um, insights that people hope to get out of data, um, they actually can drive real savings out of the gate. I wonder if you could talk about six sort strategy a little bit. I mean. I mean, Sinkstar was one of the first companies I remember when I got into the business in the yep. early 1980s, yep. right? Yep. You guys were the standard on you know, sorting the mainframe data. Um, what led you to, to big data and, and what's the strategy behind that? Yeah, so it's a great question. I mean, so we actually have been around for, I think it's 46 years, right? We were founded in 1968. Our first product was a mainframe sort utility and the architectural insight we had 
um, at the time was that uh, sorting represented about half of the workload on mainframes, and it wasn't particularly performant. So if you could make that sort operation go faster, and at the same time use less CPUs, uh, <clears throat> then you had not only a uh, better business advantage and better performance in the applications, but you actually saved money. Um, if you look at Hadoop, when we started to think about uh, Hadoop and what the architecture of Hadoop was and how it was being used, we saw a couple of things. The first was that uh, the MapReduce framework is very sort intensive. So if you have the best sort technology in the world, that could potentially be useful to accelerate the performance of uh, of the core framework. The second was we actually had a high performance ETL capability built on top of that sort. So if you could actually replace that sort, uh, you could actually plug not just our sort in, but you could plug in uh, an entire ETL capability. When we looked at how people were using Hadoop, the number one thing that they were doing was building large scale ETL routines. And so, uh, so we pursued the, uh, <clears throat> the integration of our technology with the Hadoop framework via a contribution we made last year to the community. Um, and then we uh, GA'd a uh, Hadoop ETL tool in uh, the middle of last year. Uh, what we've seen is great uptake on the solution, and people are applying it to this offload scenario. They've got a data warehouse, 50% of that capacity is dedicated to data integration workload, ELT workload, that has been there for perhaps a decade because that was where they could get scalability. Now they've got a place they can get scalability that's a fraction of the cost. Um, and we're in enabling technology to allow them to move that, that processing and that data into Hadoop environment, make it a productive uh, workload. The second thing we're seeing is that people want to be able to do that not just on-premise, they want to do it in the cloud. And what's interesting about that is that now you actually are kind of a little bit back to the future for us. Now you're in an environment where not only do you care about performance and scale, but you also care about CPU time. The lower CPU time I can have in my cloud environment, the lower I pay lower my monthly bill. Um, so we launched Iron Cluster, our Hadoop ETL offering on EMR in November, and we're seeing tremendous uh, uptake on that, and people are looking at how do I suck kind of these legacy workloads, not just into Hadoop on-premise, but potentially up into the cloud. So what are you seeing for, for EMR generally, Elastic MapReduce uptake you yeah. know, from the Amazon community? Yeah, so I mean, it's been amazing for us. We've gotten you know, a wide variety of uh, firms that are using the technology. I'd say there it's a little bit more um, <clears throat> learning what it can do and how it can fit in their environment, um, you know, largely our customer base is enterprise, and so I think enterprises are still trying to figure out where can they best apply, but, um, but you know, there's no question that the ec economics of cloud are you know, just undeniable and the flexibility and the ability to kind of not only deploy a Hadoop cluster in a couple of clicks, but add on a full func featured integrated ETL capability on top of that is pretty powerful. Josh, we always joke, Dave and I joke, Amazon is a software mainframe. Uh, if you think about yeah. it, and you look at the us old computer science operating systems guys, the mainframe back in the day, was great. I mean, yeah. it, did what it, it was the glass right. house. Everything was happening. Data processing, right. MIS. Remember those days, Dave? <laughs> the MIS department. If you look at what's going the on. The API wasn't as open, but. We're seeing the <laughs> unbundling of the software eating the world version from Mark Andreessen's vision yeah. happening now in front of us, and that is mainframe like. So yeah. it's just decentralized, right? Yeah. So you, you guys have a unique angle. I just commented on the crowd chat about that. I just want to get your perspective. If you believe that the unbundling of the mainframe concept is moving into a distributed computing world, yep. a la network is the computer, yep. uh, <laughs> hat tip Scott McNeely on that one, uh, you guys are in a good position. Can you talk about one, if you believe that, then what's the next? If you believe that's the mainframe is now the cloud, mobile, big data, yep. Yep. all the subsystems, middleware, et cetera, all kind of looking different. Yep. What's next? I mean, is it the app proliferation? What doesn't get commoditized in this new software in the world. Yeah, I frame. think it's going to move up the stack in terms of people searching for value. So um, <clears throat> I think what you'll start to see is much more um, industry-specific applications on top of uh, you know, this compute platform. Mm -hmm. And people being able to drive applications that before were not possible because of scale or cost um, or the data that was required to be you know, jammed into a relational model. So I think you'll start to see more and more industry-specific applications built on top of these platforms. And those will be offered as SaaS models or they might be offered you know, on-premise. But, um, but that's, that's where I think we'll go. You'll start to see use cases that happen over and over again and that people will start to refine and package those up and sell them as a service. And Dave just made a comment on Twitter. I saw it come across yesterday. I invoked the software mainframe, uh, you know, which always is a pin on the grenade, depending on which group you throw it at. But no, in a more serious I got I to ask you, what do you see on the commoditization? Because one thing we see in the cloud business is certainly the commoditization at infrastructure level. Yep. Platform as a service is very hot. 
and all the big data stuff's happening up on the stack. Uh, is there a part of the stack that doesn't get commoditized? Do you think the application piece will be commoditized? And, and if so, or if not, talk about that. Yeah, I, I don't think we'll see uh, all applications be commoditized, but I think you'll find that people need to find a very specific niche where they offer very unique functionality and they have a deeper understanding of user requirements. Um, and they're doing things that are hard and that will be consistently hard. Um, you know, I think an area that we believe we have special expertise in is, you know, when people move this Hadoop infrastructure into their enterprise from, uh, you know, to start to th think about things like offload, one of the things they have to do is figure out how they plug that into the mainframe. How am I going to move all these mainframe data sets into my Hadoop cluster? How am I going to move workloads that were written in COBOL and JCL into, uh, into Hadoop and rewrite them in frameworks like MapReduce? That's hard. There's subsidic to ask it. It's hard to find someone who write JCL in, in <laughs> COBOL <laughs> into Hadoop. How do I have like, <laughs> COBOL copy books and deal with the curves depending on? You know, we yeah. believe that's an area that we can continue to strengthen. We broadly refer to that as big iron to big data. So that would be an area that we believe we can, we can contain or sustain a competitive advantage because of our expertise. And I think there's lots of areas that won't be uh, you know, commoditized, but I think it's going to be, you know, vendors are going to be required to develop a very deep level of expertise in a specific area that um, they can monetize and they can maintain differentiation. How, how do you guys uh, compare and how do you guys talk about the IBM presence? Obviously they have that mainframe, big iron. A big data focus. Obviously, they have a mainframe big player there. Yeah, still big market. People have all this stuff in their legacy. I mean, how do you guys play with with, I, with IBM? Yeah, so IBM's a partner um, in a couple different ways. Um, I think that IBM has a collection of um, you know impressive capabilities. I think they're um, you know they're starting to take some moves to integrate those, um, but you know they also have some very significant businesses that derive a lot of revenue for them that they may not want to see commoditized. So there's a classic innovator's dilemma for mm -hmm. pieces of that organization. Um, I, I think what we're focused on is really how do we help customers come in, leverage this Hadoop infrastructure for, to drive you know, offload scenarios and be able to take workloads that they were performing in a non-performant manner in expensive legacy stores into Hadoop and get you know, incredible value from a savings perspective because we know those savings are going to be actually deployed back into the infrastructure to build new higher value applications and we can be a part of that. Um, I, gotta, you know, I think IBM's got the same opportunity. I got to ask you a question we asked earlier because this, this is relevant to you. Data fusion is a topic that we talked about with uh, Acti and CTO and it's yep. early on for his labs. But when you think about data fusion, it's, it's a collectively you know, mashing mashup of data yep. at a variety of different life cycles, either mm -hmm. massive ingest or pipelining it into advanced analytics, those yep. kinds of environments. So yep. what's your take on data fusion? Where is it at? Is it still kind of a concept people getting their arms around? Are you seeing it in practical use cases? So, I, you know, I, I, I think that that is affect what people are doing in, uh, in some of these big data environments. I think they're using a collection of tools today, a lot of which are custom written. Um, you know, we're seeing a wide variety of file formats that people are starting to use they haven't used in the past and that's helpful because it allows them to store this you know, hierarchical or, or semi-structured data. Um, you know, what I think is interesting is that at the end of the day, people want to submit them to analytics and they want to be able to have humans look at trends and, and be able to predict what's going to happen. To do that, they actually have to take what is some broad collection of data that tends to be structured or semi-structured or perhaps completely unstructured, but they have to derive some level of structure out of it. Um, and so that's what becomes, you know, kind of complicated. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity to create tooling that allows people to do that more easily, and I think there's been a lot of innovation in that space. I also think there's a lot of compute that has to be applied to that, because at the end of the day, I'm talking about large volumes of data that have to be transformed and related together. I think that's where there's a great opportunity for new tools to come out to help people be more productive in these big data environments, and that's where we think we have a, an opportunity to share with, the, share with the folks out there about the Sing Store a little bit more about, you know, where you guys live, you guys in uh, East Coast? Yes, we're based in the East Coast, we're based Jersey boys. just outside of, <laughs> uh, just just outside Wood of New York Lake? City, Woodcliff, Woodcliff Lake, New That's Jersey. That's my stomping ground. All right, I went to high good. school in Montvale, yep. right next door, yep. a couple yep. towns over. <laughs> so, and... Uh, Frankie Valley country. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the boroughs uh, of New Jersey. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's what, awesome. I, that's what I wanted to do was come on and talk about New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> so. About those tolls far from Fort Lee. <laughs> <laughs> so we're based in New Jersey, have been since the founding yeah. of the company. Um, as I said, we started on the mainframe side, but we've made a significant number of investments in the Hadoop world um, and continue to, uh, to make those investments. Um, you know, we've uh, brought this Hadoop ETL capability to market. Uh, this year, took that to the cloud in, uh, or I'm sorry, late last year, took that to the cloud in November. Um, you will continue to see additional offerings come out of SyncSort this year. Um, some of the, the things that we're working on uh, are really enablers around this offload scenario. So for example, if I've got a warehouse and half of it is dedicated to ELT processing that's expressed in SQL, it would be nice to be able to reflect, you know, move that workload into Hadoop, um, but there may be an opportunity to actually reflect it as traditional ETL flows. Um, so we actually built a, a SQL analyzer that will actually give you a sense of what that SQL is doing and visualize it for you so that you can understand not only how to take it and rewrite it in MapReduce paradigm, but also how to optimize it from a performance perspective. We're doing the same thing on the mainframe. So JCL and Cobol jobs that are doing batch processing. Some heavy lifting. Yep. A lot of heavy lifting. Yep. All right, so I got to ask you a question because we talked to a lot of the startups out here. How do you talk to your customers when you say, hey, what's going on Silicon Valley? All these new startups have got a B round. We just had a great startup on earlier um, that had $15 million Series B. Yep. So, you know, they're small, but they're, you know, are in beta. Um, they, the, these big customers don't want to put their bets on the enterprise. It used to be like you never had a startup right. penetrate, but now you're starting to see that. Yep. How do you deal with the startup ecosystem and this evolution of yeah. big data? Well, it's funny, you know, being from New Jersey um, and being around for a long time, I think a lot of the partner ecosystem doesn't necessarily know what to make of us. Um, but I think what they found is that we can create a lot of value for them. So, you know, if you look at some of the Hadoop distributions, all of which are good partners of ours, as they've started to move into the enterprise, they've found it very important and helpful to have friends of pe with people that, like us that know the mainframe. They know how to take that infrastructure, plug it in to these enterprises, and actually know some of the folks that run the mainframes in those enterprises, and, and we're a trusted vendor that can help them get access to that data, which is pretty important data. It tends to be about 70% of the corporate data that they have access to, and it tends to be some of the most important reference data in the form of transactions. Um, so I think what we found is that uh, you know, folks like Cloudera, Horton, MapR have been great partners. We have been able to bring value to them, help them access repositories that they wouldn't otherwise be able to access in a very easy manner. Um, at the same time, they've been great for us. You know, they've been able to, um, they've been very open to allowing us to innovate with them. So you'll be seeing some more contributions to Apache Hadoop from SyncSort this year. Um, we're working on some things with both Horton and, Map and um, Cloudera right now. Uh, and uh, you know they've been they've been ter terrific in embracing some of the expertise that we bring around performance and, and legacy uh, processing paradigms to uh, you know in, in infusing the uh, Apache Hadoop. So they're they're process. evangelizing Hadoop. They're spending you know, a lot of market effort, market development effort, yeah. doing that. And then so you're essentially um, evangelizing. <laughs> Helping them clean up the mess, the data mess. Is I, I, I wouldn't <laughs> say making, helping them clean up a mess. I don't want to. I don't want to state that they're they're um, creating any sort of mess. But I would no, say no. It's out there. I'm saying. As, right? as, pe I mean, yeah, as guys, people come a... into the enterprise, you know, they want to bring in things like mainframe data, and you know, people aren't necessarily wanting the Hadoop developers to open up. No, that's a messy task. Mainframe. Is really right. what I meant by that. So, okay. Yeah. So, so talk to a little bit more about that go to market. So you're partners with these guys, and then absolutely. And then, so how do you go to market? How do you sell? What kind of channels? Maybe to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So we we have a, a broad set of co-sell relationships with all the distributions. Um, we have a number of conversations, and you'll see partnerships roll out later this year around resale and OEM relationships. Um, in uh, with some of the appliance vendors, with um, <clears throat> some of the hardware vendors, people that are built selling things into Hadoop clusters where an ETL capability would be helpful. Um, and then we have a broad set of SI relationships, both at the global level, so Cognizant is one of our uh, premier uh, global system integrator partners, uh, and then we have a broad set of uh, boutique big data partners. So the, 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 the hardware partners, for example, are so they're partnering with you, you're sort of a go, joint go-to-market, uh, are they reselling your product? There's nothing I can announce today, but right. I can say that we're in pretty advanced conversations with a number of appliance and hardware vendors to resell our software on top of their hardware offerings to be able to deliver a prepackaged Hadoop distribution with an ETL capability. And how does it work with, with AWS? Are you part of the AWS marketplace? So with, or? with AWS, we're on the marketplace. We're the only ETL tool that's uh, on the marketplace for EMR. Um, so we are an AMI. You go on, you spin up your EMR image, and you can choose to add us to that, and it's a couple of clicks to do so.
Great, great. Well, my final question for you is more on the distros. You mentioned, obviously, you guys are, are certainly attractive for a lot of the startups because you guys have big presence, these yep. big accounts, heavy lifting, the front end loader for, probably for them to get at these accounts and yep. plow through and get some penetration. Um, but I got to ask you from someone who's out on the front lines with, with all that focus, do you see a consolidation in the distros happening? Do you see eventually, because that's been a big conversation we've been hearing all day today, is that we hear that the consolidation needs to happen on the distros. Do you believe that or not? You know, I, I think, well, first of all, it depends on how many distros we're talking about. You know, if, you're, if your list is 12 or 14, yes, I think that you're going to see some consolidation over the <laughs> course of the next 12 months. Um, but I think there is room for several uh, distros. And, and right now, I think it's been helpful to the community because I think it's driving a ton of innovation, not just in terms of, you know, the actual um, capabilities of the platform, but also in terms of how, where people are pointing it and how they're using it. So um, I, I think that you will see a smaller set, but I think that if you look at what Cloudera, Horton, and MapR are doing, um, it's very beneficial to driving adoption and driving maturation of the market. Yeah, and we know we, we got to give, you know, Cloudera props, Amar Awadala, Cube alumni, big supporter of what we do, said to us straight up when Horton rose into the field, hey, you know, more people making software around Hadoop makes everyone better. Right. I think that's a good point. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Sync Sword here on theCUBE. Josh, we really appreciate your time. Leader, doing the heavy lifting. <laughs> big iron to big data. Love that's the tagline. I'll make that the bumper sticker uh, for this segment. Uh, we'll be right back with more action here at the Hilton, right across the street from the Strata Conference going on live here in Big Data SV. Hashtag Big Data SV. Join the conversation. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.